Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, what they're saying is the most important Pro Tour of all time just happened. Oh, yeah? Why is that? Uh, that's just what they were saying, right? This was like, that's what the marketing materials uh, and chatter said. So, I can only assume that it's the most important one. I will Definitely. S- By regions, recency, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It is three big events. I will it- say... I enjoyed, you know, the the pitter patter of of constructed format to constructed format round after round without being distracted by any forty card decks. That was I, that was right in my wheelhouse on this pro tour. Man, see, I like the forty card stuff too. I my worry with the th- not worry my my whole thing with splitting three ways is I think it takes so much focus off of whoever gets the clean breaks. You know, like whoever does the sick, whoever has the deck of the tournament. You know, like it's so diffuse across so many formats. Oh, so you're saying like you might have like a an industry defining deck for one of the formats. Like this is the most important breakthrough possible. But because you came in, oh, I don't know, fifth, no one would ever know because you're not main stage in the top four on Sunday. Uh, maybe. But there's also even in the, on Sunday. I mean, take a look at uh, at. Raptor and company and Luis. Oh my God, the the Death Shadow deck that they came up with, like Luis, uh, I think did like a huge amount of the tuning for the Death Shadow deck, and it was like absurd how good the Death Shadow deck was for the format in Legacy. Uh, and as a result, they just crushed in Legacy, uh, despite the fact that like. Obviously, like Ben Stark, uh, struggled a little bit in modern. He's not Matt Nass. His use of the Ironworks combo, it was like slightly mere mortal. But like, it can be easy to lose sight of. Well, this Ironworks combo, for instance, in the finals, he lost nine in a row. <laughs> Whoa! I didn't realize that. Yeah. Th- so. That, that's part of what made the CFB comeback so insane is that like um, uh, like so their team was a long shot anyway right going in and then uh, like uh, one of the teams starts out 0-3 and it's like looking really bad but then they just go on one of those sick heaters where uh, th- things break the right way they win all their matches things are crushing but like uh, Raptor's team and Ben, uh, like Raptor, Yuza, and Stark. Let's put it this way: Raptor and Yuza won a lot of matches. <laughs> well, I mean, their team. But thank is, God the Raptor never loses ever. I mean, when your team has a you know extra extra Hall of Famers and extra Pro Tour champions and you know like a national champion thrown in or so, you know the the curve is a little different for you. Yeah, and I think that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Ben played well the whole tournament. It's just obviously it's modern and stuff can go lots of different ways. I mean, he, right? his deck is, I mean, if we want to talk about the Ironworks combo deck that Ben played for a second, this is, you know, Matt has been doing so well in the Grand Prix circuit with it, right? Like unbelievably well. Uh, Bizarrely well. Like, I mean, this is this is like preternaturally well, especially for a, a format like modern. But the deck has relatively little interaction, right? Unless you're thinking about, like, chump blocking with the scrap trawler. There's not a lot of interaction in this deck. It's, it's, I guess there's engineered explosives in the main deck. But this is just, like, a brutal race deck in game one, right? It's, I mean, you get these, like, super weird draws with multiple Mox Opals that it can win maybe turn three. But this is a deck that... If you're setting yourself up with Ancient Stirrings and you've got a Carclan Ironworks on turn four, your your likelihood of winning is very, very high then, right? Right. But it is like very little interaction. So if he's just playing against one of these decks that's like uh, Faithless Looting Aggro decks, however we want to define those, he could potentially just be raced, right? And there's very little he can do about it if they're if they've just got one of their super fast draws. Well, I think part of the problem was that the the format was – let's put it this way. Modern is a format where you can, like, sideboard to beat whoever you want. And if you do, you will beat them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, for instance, look at uh, look at 
the champion, one of the champions, Ben Hull's Black Red Hollow One deck. You know, this Vengevine deck, I mean, this, uh, sorry, this this uh, Hollow One Blood Gas deck was looking so impressive throughout the weekend. And if you look at his sideboard, four Leyline of the Voids, two Thought Seas, two Ancient Grudge. Like, I mean, when you're playing K- uh, Kruk Clan Ironworks, you do not want to play against Leyline of the Void. Because the, the co- your combo is, um, is reliant on retrieving, uh, retrieving artifacts, right, from the graveyard. Right, like Scrap Trawler and Mirror Retriever are both shut off. And that's to say nothing of that, like, for instance, Tarion doesn't draw you a card. <laughs> and Iker Wellspring... Uh, only draws you a card on the way in, not a card on the way out. And Chromatic Star doesn't draw you a card. So, like, you have, like, 12 of your cards that instead of drawing a card, do not draw a card. They just cost a mana or two. And then and then you, uh, also, your whole combo doesn't work. <laughs> and so it's, but the cantrips matter, too. It's not just that, because, like, obviously, you're going to play with some cards in your deck. Like, you have these nature's claims to try to get out of it. But you can't really go find them when all of your artifact mana can't really sacrifice to draw cards. Like, the last thing you want to do is sacrifice a chromatic star to wash a color of mana and get no card for it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough. So, anyway, my point is that it was a really hostile field for, for Stark and the uh, KCI deck. But it's, it's not just the, the Champions deck, right? Like, you have cards like Kataki's War Wage in the format, which it doesn't shut the deck down, but it certainly oh, it it like slows the deck down, right? Like, you know, these human decks have got, like, Kataki and Reclamation Sage, and they've got, like, a clock, right? So... It's not that it's not that they're, you know, oh, Kentucky's not an auto win here like like it, it's been in against Affinity in some formats. But it's it's cumbersome for Ironworks, right, which is an 18 land deck. Oh, yeah. And that's not even the end of it, because they, they, these human decks like uh, both the third and fourth place humans decks play Kataki despite it being a spirit instead of a human. Yeah. But uh, and then being they, Aether Vile decks. <laughs> They also have, uh, obviously, they have the little stuff like Reclamation Sage, uh, but they also have Dampening Sphere. Dampening Sphere definitely puts a hurting on the KCI deck. They just can't go off. Because each spell that they would cast costs one more for each other spell they've cast that turn. So, like, when they're trying to loop Mirror Retriever or Scrap Trawler, they're just making their spells progressively more expensive. It does not take very many Dampening Sphere triggers to make a uh, KCI to, to offset the mana advantage from a Quark Clan Ironworks. I, I mean, and even stuff like in their main deck, if you go second turn, cast Meddling Mage, name the card Quark Clan Ironworks, are there any outs? Pirate Spell Bomb? That's it, right? Two Pirate Spell Bomb? And it's not like Thalia is what they want to face. Yeah, so... Oh, I guess they also have Engineer Explosives. But the thing is, like, these are not great answers to a two-drop in a deck that has potentially, like, a mad amount of humans, you know, linear aggro. It's disrupting you with Kitesail Freebooters and getting in there with uh, Mantis Riders, etc. Like, the, it's, it's putting substantial pressure on your combo while putting pressure on your life total. And we're not even talking about maniacs who have cards that are, let's say, an enchantment that's like one in a white, turn off all artifacts, right? Like, <laughs> that's a card that people play. Right. And it's not like rest in peace is good for them either. Yeah, yeah the same maniacs play both cards oftentimes. So uh, in Legacy, however... I uh, did want to call out that uh, the that Raptor and Luis's blue black Death Shadow deck. Woo. Yeah, let's Man. dwell on this deck for a while. I mean, this could be like a whole episode. This deck, right? Like, so oh, good. Okay, so I watched Raptor play. He won a real tight one to beat Jonathan Sukenik at the end of day one. Uh, for for them to go, I believe, undefeated at the end of day one. I just actually just want to shout out because I played against Sukenik a ton of times on, on the SCG tour. I never appreciated what a master he is. He's very good. But Raptor outlasted him with this brand new deck, Black Blue Death Shadow. 
And like all the little angles and all the little edges on this deck are so perfect. Like if you look at this deck and it's a it's a fetch land deck, right? He's got Blood Sane Mire and Flooded Strand and Marsh Flats and Watery Grave. This is the Underground Sea uh, format. He's got three Watery Grave and only two Underground Sea. Why? You gotta do damage to yourself. Yep, you gotta do damage to yourself, right? And he's got Snuff Out. Holy Snuff Out. That's like Shades of the Days of Napster. I mean, no, the- Snuff Out shows up in Legacy sometimes. Yeah, but it, not, not as a giant growth. I mean, like, <laughs> it's just like take out your blocker and invigorate you to death. That that's what that card is. Like that reanimates the nice one. Oh my gosh! He God, was, when you reanimate the street wraith, he well against yeah, because we yeah, because if you okay, you pay two, so you go land, fetch, crack sack, take two on Conley Woods. Then you're at seventeen. You cycle your street wraith. You're at fifteen. You reanimate your street wraith. You're already at ten, right? And what's even better is if you go, instead of all that on turn one, if you just go crack, sack, fetch, take two, then thought sees you. Now you're at 15. You take their interaction. On the next turn, you cycle Street Wraith. You're at 13. You reanimate your Street Wraith. You're at eight. And you drop your Death Shadow. And you're already doing it. Oh. Heaven forbid they play like a, a Delver for you to snuff out so that you can kill them in two turns. The, yeah, it's actually so just based on some of the threats in the format. It's so valuable this reanimate against against Sukenic again in this match. Like Sukenic looked like he was coming back, and he's just like you know Raptors ahead, 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 and he's like he's coming back. Uh, Raptor dazes his his Gurmag Angler, and then. The next turn, he rips Death Shadow, but he's at, like, 13, so it's just, it doesn't matter. But he reanimates the Gurmag Angler, which puts him down so that the Gurmag Angler and the Death Shadow that he just ripped are now both lethal. And it was like, whoa, what just happened? Like, <laughs> that's insane how they're using life total in this deck. Like, it, it's weird that it's so elegant and powerful. Like, it's just, it's like, it's like... Warhammer powerful, like broadsword powerful in a format where life total is is not something that people just hurl around willy nilly necessarily. Right. Because because of all the price of progresses and and things like that, you know, blue decks are price of progressing you in, the, in this format sometimes. Yeah. So uh, I don't think price of progress. I think the price of progress stuff might be slightly you're a burn player. But uh, a lot of people played blue red Delver in this in this in this uh, tournament. <laughs> and they obviously didn't do that true. well, but they played it. Nobody played dude, burn in, in legacy. Zero. People. Dude, three ponders, one preordain. You don't just wake up one day and decide you're going to do a three one split of ponder and preordain. Uh, yeah, that that's unusual to me. Uh, do you have any insight on that? Uh, I don't know for certain, but from the looks of it, I'm guessing that it's one of those deals where Ponder's better, but they made the judgment call that the diminishing return, like the second Ponder, is just not enough better than the preordained to make up for the situations in which you don't want to crack a fetch land yet. You don't want to have to commit to whether you're you're getting Watery Grave or Underground Sea. And so, like... Rather, if you'd rather draw, like if you definitely, definitely want a ponder and not a preordain, but you would prefer a preordain and a ponder instead of two ponders, then I think a three-one split is totally reasonable. Well, it's they're both very good cards. I I don't know, uh, dude. Dude, it's you, here's the move. I'm gonna thought seize you. Take your Grizzle Brand. Okay. Now I'm going to reanimate your Grizzle Brand. <laughs> so let's see. I took 10 right off bat, but then I Grizzle Brand, pay 7 life so that my Death Shadow's a 10 10. Plus, I just have a Grizzle Brand. Doesn't that seem so dope? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, you had me at reanimate your Grizzle Brand. <laughs> you had me at that one. Uh, can you, what's up with Throne of Geth? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Throne of Geth. Yeah, I put Raptor. Oh, yeah. That, oh, sh- 
I put him up on that a little bit back, and now he just jams it in every single deck. That's my move for Ever Flowing Chalice. That's how blue black decks were born. Not Ever Flowing Chalice, sorry. Uh, the, the Chalice of the Void. That's like when somebody is going to drop a, a Chalice of the Void for one against you, and you're playing some blue black deck, you got to throw in a Gethum. Because you, you just put the Throne of Geth down, and then you sacrifice the Throne of Geth to proliferate, and then you increase the number of counters so that now your opponent's Chalice is a Chalice on two. Oh, wow. Not, o- not only did you destroy their Chalice, you blocked them from ever playing another one, and anybody who plays a Chalice against you, for one is so above average likely to be wrecked by a chalice on two. That is insane. This also messes, I mean, probably wouldn't come in in that matchup because it's so fast, but it would, like messes up Aether Vile math. Yeah, I I don't think it's going to come in there. I'm pretty, I think it's going to be mostly just the uh, the chalice, but it could, you never know. There's good, it's legacy. People do little weird things. Like maybe, maybe they'll randomly just have an engineered explosives in play on zero to get out of or, or something right and then you could like increase it so that now it's on one and they were tapped out so they couldn't sacrifice it and now it won't actually get rid of their own chalice anymore um i don't know do you often have liliana the last hope in against decks that have chalice of the void like maybe you want to probably yeah, you do. Them both sometimes, at the same time yeah, not all not not all that often but sometimes it'll come up you could do that I, I think that what you're going to find, though, is that the little nickel and dime prol- proliferate advantage, it's fun to think about. That's not really the – that's not going to be what's going on. The thing that's going on is that you're getting rid of their chalice on one that stops almost every single card in your deck. Yeah. And you're turning it into a chalice on two, stopping so many of the best cards in their deck. So it's just – it is a very, very, very high leverage card for that exact one interaction. That is awesome. That is, yeah, that, love it. Yeah, uh, oh, you, think you should have seen in- how happy he was the first time talking about that whole experience. Oh, my God. Do you think it's it's playable in, in other strategies? Do you think other people should just be destroying artifacts or something? You know, th- there's not, not good... Uh, Anti- it couldn't, yeah, it, in, in my experience, I mean, we always talk about it for other strategies. It's never come up that I've ever wanted it anywhere really besides blue-black. Because, like, at the end of the day, the uh, some of the interaction cards in red, green, and white are just so good and so good against other matchups, too. Yeah. But... I think that if you're exactly blue black or if you're mono black or you're mono blue or you know as long as you don't have access to red, green or white mana <laughs> then and all you care about in this world is stopping a throne of uh, a stopping a chalice on one and you don't play cards that cost two well throne of geth is the card for you it's a very <laughs> very specialized card But God is it good at its one thing. I believe it. That sounds awesome, Patrick. Uh, The cool thing, like Diabolic Edict is just really looks like it's been doing special work in uh, in Legacy. Yeah. And the instant part is actually important. It's not like you're ever going to get any extra value from any of the various sorcery speed ones. And I think that there's enough times that people do stuff like, oh, I'm sneak attacking something, you know. This is mostly for true name nemesis, right? That's the big one. But the reason that it's a that you're using diabolic edict instead of any other edict is for some of the other matchups. But you can use it's good against. I mean, it's 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 particularly good against true name nemesis. That's its primary uh, its primary target of choice, I suppose. Is there a reason you'd play this instead of Geth's verdict? Instead of Geth's verdict? Yeah, because yeah, you have four wastelands in your deck. Oh, okay. One life is so inconsequential compared to the wasteland. Oh, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't thinking that way because I was thinking all of the all of the searchable mana is black and blue. There's no basics in this deck. So this deck is nine mana producing lands, including four wastelands. So you can is is this ever on like the wrong side of like uh, 
just wastelands and and Rishadon ports, etc. Yeah, uh, I think there, some of that stuff comes up definitely, but like you, the the land options, like uh, I mean, Rishadon port doesn't really do all that much. The bigger thing is just the fact that if somebody plays certain cards like Blood Moon, for instance, they lock you out. But you're just trying to rely on the fact that you have uh, eight zero mana counter spells, uh, one mana interaction like Stubborn Denial and Thought Seize. So you actually have uh, 14 ways to stop a Blood Moon on one or less mana. And then you're seeing cards much more frequently because of stuff like Brainstorm, Ponder, Street Wraith, and so on. And you only ever need to stick one card. You could realistically go turn one Delver, get locked out, and then just try to ride it. Hey, three a turn. You know? The thing that sucks, though, is that you can't snuff out uh, if you get locked out because of uh, Blood Moon. Oh, because you don't have a swamp anymore. Right. You need to have actual underground sea or watery grave. Yeah, I th- I thought that that mana base, including watery grave, was such a work of of mastery. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so anyway, definitely definitely a super cool deck, uh, but not the only legacy deck of note. And part of the reason why Raptor had three Dread of Knights in the sideboard by the top, like in testing, one thing that became clear. Uh, and it sounded like the whole C- team CFB agreed that uh, death and taxes is one of the it, their their position on death and taxes is that it's a high tier one uh, defining archetype in legacy that it's one of the it's not just a metagame call that it has a recent new addition that has skyrocketed it to being one of the pillars of the format in a deck that they expect to be extremely good going forward, even with people knowing about it. And that's death and taxes such as Alan Wu, because the new card. So they, they gained a couple cards recently, you know, like obviously stuff like, um, Sanctum Prelate is somewhat new, but not completely. But the real the real addition that's just a game changer is Palace Jailer. And they have access to the Palace Jailer more often because of some of the tutors that we'll get to in a second. But Palace Jailer is uh, that, uh, you know, it's from one of the, the, the funny conspiracy uh, products, right? So it's uh, two white-white for a 2-2 two, two that... Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. And the monarch, the way the monarch mechanic works as the refresher is that when somebody has the monarch status, they're just the monarch. For, it's like the city's blessing. They're just the monarch from now on until somebody else becomes the monarch. So it's like a city's blessing, but only one person can have it at a time, and whoever has it most recently is it. Well, not surprisingly, there are very few cards that people play in Legacy that make you the Monarch. So once you become come the Monarch with Palace Jailer, it usually sticks. And then his other ability is when uh, he enters the battlefield, exile target creature an opponent controls until an opponent becomes the Monarch. So, so this you, is like wildly better than the the previous versions of creatures that come into play and exile a creature until like it leaves play right so even if you kill the palace jailer because you haven't lost your monarch status the creature remains exiled right right exactly for four mana it's a necrotol that can hit anything and it exiles it so like it's graveyard hate it can take down whatever creature you know, it kills Death Shadows, Tarmogoyfs, whatever the thing is. And it does it permanently where they don't get it back. And that's to say nothing of just how many people, and, and this is, I know you always love this kind of edge, the number of people who read the card and then after reading it, lightning bolt the Palace Jailer expecting <laughs> to get their card back. But it's like, no, no, it's gone until you become the Monarch. And they're like, well, how do I become the Monarch? And they're like, well, did you play with any cards that will make you the Monarch? 
So Palace Jailer is just an incredible new dimension for these death and taxes decks. Because remember, it's not just that it's a um, a hard kill removal spell for four that also gives them a 2-2 body. I uh, First of all, you can search it up with these Recruiter of the Guards, which is the two and a white, another conspiracy product. You know, the two and a white, one, one, that when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a creature with toughness, two or less, reveal it and put it in your hand and shuffle your library. So your Recruiter of the Guards mean you have access to uh, your Palace Jailer more often. And Aether Vial curves perfect, because you can, if you need to, and obviously you don't want your Vial at four, but if you need to, you can go Vile on three, go get the Recruiter of the Guard that will go get the Palace Jailer, untap Vile on four, Palace Jailer. And uh, once you actually stick the Palace Jailer, now you get to abuse it. It's not just that you exile one. You can actually Flicker Wisp the Palace Jailer to oh, get another wow. trigger. Yeah. Right, and you can Flicker Wisp the Recruiter of the Guard. Because remember, you can Recruiter of the Guard and go get Flicker Wisp and then cast Flicker. So, like, if you have a Vile, a standard play is to go Vile down my Recruiter, go get a Flicker Wisp, untap, Vile down the Flicker Wisp to blink the Recruiter and go get whatever else you want. So it plays sort of like almost this Goblins deck where you just start chaining tons of free material together. Yeah, you know, by the way, you've got Aether Vile, Stoneforge, Mystic, and Thalia, so your A game without all the, all the goofy stuff is, like, super high impact, super high quality cards. Yeah, I mean, so Stoneforge, Mystic, Batterskull, and Sword and Gite, obviously a really good plan. Swords to Plowshares, excellent interaction, right? But he's also got Frexian Revoker, X4, Thalia X4, and the ability to go find this Sanctum Prelate when you need it. And Sanctum Prelate is like a meddling mage for an entire number. Oh, yeah. At, like, one seems insane to me. Right. It's just like you, it's like a chalice of the void, but also you can tutor it up and you can still play your cards. Right? Like, it stops the brainstorm, the ponder, the whatever. It's it's so powerful of an added dimension, right? And there's even more. There's so much conspiracy stuff in this deck. If you look at his sideboard, he's got from one of the older, uh, from one of the one of the uh, the other commander products, Containment Priest, which is one in a white, two two flash. If a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and wasn't cast, exile it instead. That, so, that's for instance, one of the big question marks I have about Alan Wu's build. I mean, Containment Priest, you know, is actually a card I own a play set of because uh, it seemed so awesome to me when it came out. Um, I'm just wondering why he doesn't have at least one main deck and access to two to four of them total. This seems like one of the one of the kind of cards that you would really, uh, really want. No, it's tough because once you play it, you lock out Vile. Yeah, but like in the matchups that you want it, like, I mean, the fact and you, you board it in. Yeah, but there's only one. Yeah, but you, have to, you can tutor with the recruiter of the guard. Yeah, that there's there's small there's small uh, it's because, consolation like, to that when people are are you know third turning you with sneak and show or reanimating off of dark rituals. Like, you well, just, I mean, you but he's got other stuff. You know, you don't because you could also just draw rest in peace. Uh, I guess this is like one of the absolute best decks to play against, like Emrakul, Right, he has three Caracas. I can't. Yeah, it, I yeah. guess it's just great. Never mind. And then like. Like, uh, Aether Sworn Canonist is also good as a target. Fairy Macabre is also good as a target. But there's going to be times where it's kind of nice to just surprise Vile down a Recruiter of the Guard and go get uh, your one Fairy Macabre. Yeah, this and then is so cool. There's yet another, another one, Council's Judgment. And this is one that... Like, I was rocking the last Legacy Tournament I played in, so this has been around for a couple Commander products, but it's the one white-white sorcery will of the Council. Starting with you, each player votes for a non-land permanent you don't control. Exile each permanent with the most votes or tied for the most votes. So this is a baffling template. But the end result is if your opponent knows what's up, they should vote for what you vote for. Because 
you're going to vote for one of their non-land permanents. And as long as they vote for the same permanent, which they get to vote after you, if they vote for the same permanent, that permanent will be destroyed. That non-land permanent will be destroyed. Exiled. Exiled, right. And if they... But if they get fancy and pick something else, <laughs> both are exiled. Yeah. It does give them the upside, though, of if they just really want to get rid of their own permanent. You know, like this is can. like a vindicate sort of maelstrom pulse sort of thing. You never miss, right? Yeah, it's like an oblivion ring that doesn't come back. You never miss. You just give them the upside of if they want to exile one of their permanents, they get to. And it's not trivial sometimes to cast. I mean, when your deck has four ports and four wastelands, double white is like a real thing. But anyway, uh, just wanted to make sure that people know this deck is the real deal. This deck is legit, and uh, we're going to see a lot more of it in the weeks to come in uh, Legacy events. Uh, I, I like the discipline, too, by the way, of the two path to exile on the sideboard, having access to just more spot removal, but having a blend. Council's judgment is so good, but you don't want to have just like a glut of threes in a format like Legacy and having access to some amount of uh, additional one cost interaction is is important. Talk to and then finally about oh, the lands, right? So only one horizon canopy. One Mishra's Factory, but then, like, six Snow-Covered Plains and five Plains? Like, just any any thoughts about this? <laughs> well, you know, I think the six Snow-Covered Plains is in lieu of the fourth Caracas, because if you draw two Caracas, the legendary land rule kind of gets you. Yeah. But, like, there's no real reason to have a split between Snow-Covered Plains and Plains other than to, yeah, I don't know, to baffle your opponent. <laughs> It's well, not like in Storm, right, where you can gifts for Island and Snow-Covered Island, right? Like, I bet there's some tiny little micro-edge. Yeah? This is but, actually my kind of deck. I don't know why I don't have, like, a positive emotional attachment to it. Like, it's, it's, got, it's got a powerful offense, high-quality cards, and it's full of tricks, right? Like, it's oh, yeah. full of tiny edges that will, like... Like, it's like having Russian dramakas or something. <laughs> like, There's going to be little things. Like, when your opponent tries to kill your Thalia and you're like... Or no, like, let's say you have a Thalia. You just cast it. And your opponent doesn't force a will. It doesn't counter it because they're like, well, I'm just going to bolt it. Yeah. Right? You playing Thalia doesn't create any triggers once it's in play. Now you have priority again and you just calmly play Caracas. And now they can't lightning bolt your Thalia because you'll just bounce it since she's a legend. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. I mean, this deck is just, when it first came out, it was kind of a metagame foil, specifically against Sneak and Show, right? Because, like, Caracas is so insane against a deck whose all their threats are just Grizzlebrand and, and Emrakul. Uh, and then it has, like, all these, like, minor ways of, of interacting with... Uh, with uh, you know, a deck that's all in on getting one giant creature. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also just very good at grinding. And I think that its longevity is actually part of the reason why he only plays one Horizon Canopy. It's uh, the game's, like, by the if the game drags out, there's just such a long tail of opportunity for this deck to get advantages as the game stretches out. The last thing he needs to do is put himself in a position of sacrificing very much life early on to uh, to have that late game potential, because the, the matchups really do involve racing sometimes. You know, most of the time it's not going to matter, but also most of the time the card that you could get from Horizon Canopy is not going to matter. So um, I, I think that part... It's totally reasonable. Like just this, wanting to mitigate the amount of life that you're, you know, life that you're exposing yourself to. Like the deck is surprisingly card advantageous, right? Like it seems like it's just a bunch of little duders, but like um, Mother of Runes and of course Stoneforge Mystic are potential sources of of uh, both short and long term card advantage. Uh, and then you start flicker wisping your Stoneforge Mystic stuff like that, and you can uh, you, a single Stoneforge Mystic can get you a bunch of equipment. Right. 
Um, uh, a man after your own heart. Marcio's list had a sick little a sick little twist. Uh, Marcio Carvalho's team finished third. Uh, he had two. So first of all, he's got two Sanctum Prelates in the main deck instead of just one, and only one Recruiter of the Guard. Because at a certain point, if you're just Recruiter of the Guarding for Sanctum Prelate and Palace Jailer so much. Well, in this case, he just played a second jailer and a second prelate so that he can just draw him. Yeah, I like that. But then second of all, two Sarah Avengers. This is a man who wants to win the state championships. Two Sarah Avengers. Got to fly over moat. Got to do it. But you also, just... he didn't dink around with any of that snow covered stuff. So I'm guessing I'm guessing the snow covered stuff wasn't right. And you're just going to get ice quaked at some point. But he's got Caverner Souls, which does actually have some. Um... Some extra value. Yeah. I think Marcio is one of the absolute just top of the game right now deck builders. Like in terms of the way he's tuning existing lists, like the the, the existing macro strategies, doesn't matter even the format. Standard, modern, legacy, whatever. Uh, he's definitely on some elite, elite deck tuning and uh, performance with, uh, in these uh, constructed events, man. So uh, about a year ago, uh, when uh, when the the Hazard Red deck won won uh, standard Pro Tour, right? Pro Tour, uh, uh, which was uh, right. So a year ago, Hazard wins. Yeah, it has and wins, right. Red was on hell of a terror. So we were uh, we were playing an F and M. And I, I won F and M with a mono red deck. And I'm just like, this is just the best deck. And we go back to like. Uh, Landy Ho's apartment to like hang out you know just like play magic and like watch Twitch stream or whatever um, and, I'm like, and I'm like man this deck is so good I would just crush your stupid death and taxes deck from uh, from Legacy this deck is so good <laughs> and Lance is just like I'll take that <laughs> So we played, and I have forgotten not only that the, the Texas deck had Richard on port, but also Swords to Plowshares we played like yeah. seven games. The red deck didn't win any of them. So I had mispriced that claim. Just in case anyone was wondering, standard mono red, no good against legacy death and taxes. No good. <laughs> uh, definitely never would have been able to, uh, to guess that one. Um, over yeah, in that actually- port is a, that's a killer. <laughs> Dude, if we can if we can look at standard for just a second, I know we've been like real focused on legacy, but yeah. uh, Greg Orange was just dominating all weekend with this blue white control deck. Wanted to take a look at uh, some of the the little quirks. You know, he's he's had a lot of success with blue white control anyway, and uh, I'm I got a good feeling that this is a this is a well tuned version of the archetype. In this spot, he's playing four to fairy. One gear hulk. He's not getting fancy like some of the people, you know. No, no pay seven to second son. No split with Teferi and lots of other things. Four Teferi, and then the alternate plan is one gear hulk. And then his list. Whew, this is a beautiful mix. Like, despite that one gear hulk, he's not letting it scare him off of playing three cast out and four seal away. He's got a 2-2 split of Glimmer of Genius and Hieroglyphic Illumination, which I thought was really interesting. Well, it's in- yeah, like, Hieroglyphic Illumination is so much better with Search Frescanta, and Glimmer of Genius is so much better most of the rest of the time, right? Well, it's also nice if you draw two to have one of each. You, like, you just want to cycle one? Yeah, I think like mid game, you almost always want Glimmer, right? Like, yeah, but but it doesn't necessarily always matter. Right? Early, you might have only one, and you want it to be hieroglyphic illumination. My point is that they both have pros and cons. They're both absurdly good. Oh, yeah. No, and then no. uh, the split, three settle the wreckage, two of two fumigate. Uh, and then two syncopate, one negate, two essence scatter, one commit to memory, one blink of an eye, and four disallow. You know, it just seems like it's, uh, he's even got one Arch of Arazka for additional late game card draw. Um, I like it. I like the Arch. Uh, I think I, I, I think I could see myself playing a deck like this. Yeah? 
Yeah, I think I could. This I could do it. This seems like a this seems like a solid deck. Um, the the sideboard like, was you int- know I bet this is the kind of deck that would really reward you because like you're you're so good at at squeaking out the like Aww, if somebody Michael J if somebody gives you a crack in the the crack in the wall you got them right you're, you're gonna every you just get through the, the crack in the wall like that's why you were so good in like call blade mirror matches like versus like a lot of players are gonna sit there and play this kind of deck and they're against like soulless red black and they're just gonna win the games that they're supposed to win right and then they're gonna get blown out in the games that they're not supposed to win but you're just like oh give me like any small small crack and i'm gonna position you know, the, the seal away at the correct time versus, you know, the essence scatter versus the blink of an eye, even though, the, you know, the average player values them. Maybe. So I don't know. You're, kind, you're too kind. I think you're too flattering. But it is a challenging deck with a lot of decisions. Um, but, man, I don't hate just switching into Lear Dawnbringer mode, you know, with one Nezahal, the Primal Tide, and one Kefnet, the Mindful, for when you got to switch it on him. Plus, obviously, the two Torrential Gear Hulks. But that's just... That's so many beaters, right? Like seven different victory conditions. Not diff- They're not all different, but seven victory conditions spread across four styles of play. That's that's a pretty solid plan. Uh, I mean, no arguments. The Kefnet is really the one that jumps out to me. Uh, we haven't seen this god in a while, but it's just if it resolves, it's just it's just got to be the most dominating thing you can have in, in a matchup where it's the appropriate thing to play. It's it, it can be pretty good, and I think it's one of those. It's nice to have the plan that people aren't preparing for, and Kefnet has fallen out of favor enough that it was kind of a sweet little curveball. Uh, and if we're going to be talking about standard, we would be remiss to not mention the uh, the Time Walk deck, the Nexus of Fate deck. Uh, that. Six of six is obviously all that controversy around Nexus of Fate being a buy box promo and you just can't open them. You know, God, can you imagine one of the judges asking one of the dealers? So did you bring enough Nexus of Fates for everybody? Just stone face and the dealer saying, uh, no, we didn't bring any. (laughs) And the judge is like, why not? And he says, because we we opened a ton of product, but we didn't. We didn't open a single one. Weird, huh? And the judge just uh, didn't even. The judge just. Oh yeah, that is weird. <laughs> it's, that's but, not weird at all, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. The uh, Nexus of Fate is the five blue blue instant. Take an extra turn after this one. If Nexus of Fate would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal Nexus of Fate and shuffle it into its owner's library instead. That's the killer clause on the card. I mean... So that on your opponent's end step, you can go Nexus of Fate and then untap and just have two straight turns. Right? Like, that's I that's mean, pretty... At and so, least two straight turns, like if you don't draw another Nexus of Fate or perhaps a, you know, a Karn's Temporal, Karn's sundering. temporal sundering. Right. And uh, Dave, so Dave Williams and Ben Rubin, their version did better than the other people's. I think uh, Dave and Ben, uh, they they won uh, like, I don't know, it was like 80 something percent. And a couple other people did all right. A couple people did uh, medium. But um the big twists here. So first of all, one of the distinctions from, and by the way, you'll love this. This list was a Nassif Heezy collaboration. Like this was old school, actual yellow hat and Herber Heezy brewing up the filthy turbo fog decks. And it was actually just unreal sick. And their version was a little bit different than some of the other teams. Like, uh, for instance, the Marari Conjecture and Two Secrets of the Golden City. Man, Secrets of the Golden City is cool. Now, what's notable, I think that uh, at least Dave mentioned uh, if he were to do it again, he thinks he might cut the Two Secrets of the Golden City. guess they weren't that cool. Um, and if you don't play, and Heezy said that if you cut the Secrets of the Golden City, then you should cut the Marari Conjecture. No, seriously. So all of the things that they that made their deck unique. 
Well, not necessarily. No, 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 no. So here's some of the things that made their deck unique. To begin with, two Karns instead of four. Uh, and then they played 26 land instead of 24. And then they played one Karns Temporal Sundering instead of four. Instead of extra Karns Temporal so, so they So to begin with, changing two Karns into two Glimmer of Genius... That is a meaningful difference, right? And then uh, playing just one Karn's Temporal Sundering and cutting the other three so that you can get, uh, you know, more card draw and land. Like, their, their twist was they just played with more card draw and land. I, I can't argue with that. That is just classic Aaron Forsythe's. Plus, you never know when cleansing Nova is just going to surprise somebody out of the sideboard. I mean, if you just look at just the basic strategy in the deck, right? You just go like third turn gift to paradise on your land, right? Gain some life. The next turn, you can just, you know, you have enough mana to lay out Teferi, right? But Teferi now does double work if it untaps the gift to paradise land. Right. Yeah. Like, that's pretty good. Definitely, particularly since Nexus of Fate is an instant yeah, so... So that uh, you can benefit. You can spend them in on your turn and then untap, and you're like, well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and Nexus of Fate. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's that got that, that uh, benefit. Then also, just like, just the ramping itself, putting you in a position to cast super expensive cards like a Nexus of Fate, right? So... Um, all, all, all the lands matter. Uh, Gift of Paradise gives you basically an extra one. And the, the, that's like, I don't know, the, the Nexus of Fate sort of time walking sort of Teferi Hero of Dominaria part of the deck is almost the plan B, even though that's, no. how, even though that's how all the games go, right? Which, no, I think that's the plan A is definitely ultimate Teferi. That's the whole point. What you want to do is you want to put yourself in a position where you can go... Because uh, you're not taking infinite turns with this deck. You could. No, you're not going to. That's not that's not how it plays out. The way that you see, that's the difference is that I think most of the other people were really focused on taking as many turns as they could. The thing that made Heezy and the Seif's version so brilliant is that it was more focused on we don't need to take all the turns. We just need to take enough turns for Teferi to ultimate. Because, like, um, once Teferi ultimates, you've already won. <laughs> well, but the I think, you know, people are calling this a Turbo Fog deck, right? So it's got eight Oh, it's, of, it's, it's much more of a Turbo Fog deck than, than an Infinite Time Walk deck. That's what I'm saying, that the, that part of the deck is like the plan B. Because the, to, to me, the plan A is, like, just build some, build some medium advantages while casting Haze of Pollen and Root Snare. Uh, to I'm telling alive. you, man. No, 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 no. The fogs are to buy your Teferi enough time to ultimate. That's the whole point. That's what you want to do. The reason to Haze of Palin or Root Snare is so that you can make Teferi live long enough to ultimate. You just need to bridge. He comes down, you plus him, he's at five. If you can buy yourself three turns with fogs and Nexus of Fate or whatever then you get to play the game with Teferi's ultimate. So that's, uh, you know, that's pretty awesome, especially when you're playing cards that draw extra cards or like Charter Course, for example. It's a minor thing here because this deck doesn't attack very often. It doesn't attack never, but it doesn't attack very often. But you can Charter right. Course and discard uh, Nexus of Fate, and the Clause of Nexus of Fate will actually put it back into your library instead of being into the graveyard, which I think is that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I got a feeling most of the time I think you're going to be like pitching a fog you didn't want or more likely an extra land. Yep. But if you're a little short on mana and you're trying to a coursing just to try to fix your draw, there's nothing wrong with if you've got multiple nexuses of fate, sometimes you've got to put one back, you know, and have another look at it later. Yeah, so uh, th this is do you think this is one of those decks? Because occasionally we have those decks that are like. Huge splash on the Pro Tour, you know, enormous win percentage, uh, but then 
fade out of standard for the amateur events or the Grand Prix or the Opens afterwards? Do you think this one's going to stick? I don't know. I don't know. Normally, I would say for sure it fades, and it probably does. But I think that Teferi is such a messed up card, and this is such a messed up aspect, like an angle to be able to add. I'm going to be doing a lot of work with Nexus of Fate in the uh, in the weeks to come because I don't think that we've necessarily seen all there is to see with with this card. Yeah, the I, instant part is the part that's just so truly messed up. Like I'm thinking, maybe push the green aspect of the deck even more. Like Gift of Paradise is obviously really strong with Teferi, but like. Why is, for example, Spring to Mind not not a great card to play in this strategy? That seems like I would rather have Spring to Mind than Glimmer of Genius, just for sake of argument, right? Like, uh, I don't know. I, I card. Yeah, not as good as Glimmer of Genius, though. I mean, it's half of Glimmer of Genius, right? And I'd rather have all of Glimmer of Genius. But Spring to Mind gives you a fourth turn to Fairy sometimes. It does like, straight it does. into straight into a haze of pollen and then then you're already at glimmer mode and you've already protected yourself and teferi with your with your first fog i mean i think like just some some um frequency increase on the on the mana acceleration there might be might be great it could be it could be um yeah i i don't know enough about the ins and the outs there i do think that the gift of paradise also giving you a rebate the turn you play it you know, obviously not on turn three, but if you play Gift of Paradise any turn after that, it's kind of only costing you two mana sure. instead of three. And I think that three life really does matter. Oh, I think that Gift of Paradise, I wouldn't consider cutting it. It's so good with Teferi. I, I was just thinking like addition of Spring to Mind, like even more ramping rather than rather than some other area of focus. Like especially, I think, like if you look at the way this deck is... You could cut Secrets of the Golden City for it. Well, if you look at how the deck is constructed in the main deck, there aren't a lot of counter spells in this main deck, right? So no. it, if you're if you're playing against the mirror match, right, you've got a lot of useless haze of pollens and root snares, but then the rest of it is just brute force. I think that you really want a card like you would theoretically really want a card like Spring to Mind, which gets you to your powerful cards faster when they're going to resolve anyway, right? And also gives you brute force on the backside. Just a thought. Maybe, because I don't think it's... I don't know that it's always a race, though. Isn't it just about just accumulation of material? No, you're not attritioning, and most of your material doesn't matter. It's literally just whoever can ultimate to fairy first. Yeah, so in my mind, like, I, me having more material makes, it, makes that more likely, but maybe... Right? No, because, like... Like, so, for instance, which one of us is going to Teferi... Uh, ultimate more often you have a spring to mind and i have another karn's temporal sundering well it's not clear if i can it's right it's not clear but if i cast my teferi a turn like two turns faster than you you know or a turn faster than two you, turns faster it might be i don't know right like not because of spring to mind there could be well, one the first teferi isn't necessarily going to live right the opponent can just cast a teferi and then just you know donk your teferi and then then i don't know what we're even what world we're even in then this seems like the mirror match would be extremely confusing <laughs> yeah i i think i think in the mirror match you're gonna end up just wanting cards like negate and jace's defeat because yeah, you're gonna want to the the to... <laughs> right and i think that in the main deck uh i wouldn't worry too much about teching up for the mirror well you know if the deck becomes popular right like you're gonna have to think about fighting the mirror Right. That's yeah. I'm just saying that like playing a Teferi a turn ahead of schedule is not what the, I, I I think you're going to find that it's not about the race there because like you're not always going to have to ferry. Sometimes you're going to go turn three spring to mind and then you're just not going to have anything that does anything. You just have more cycling. You're like, OK, now I'm casting Charter Course. Now I'm casting and now I'm cycling my Haze Pollen. Now I'm casting Glimmer Genius or whatever. I think that. Uh, it's just not high impact enough. If you're going to play something for the mirror main deck, I think you could you could get higher impact other ways. But either way, the point is this deck is man, it is a thing. And my hope is that we are going to magically find out that there's a oodles of additional nexus of fates dropping dropping in uh, everywhere in a month or two. 
Um, uh, good. Yep. One of the big ways that uh, people played this deck, you know, not not the version that Dave played to fifth position uh, in, um, uh, was to, to sideboard very very differently, right? Like uh, four Jace's defeat, three cast out, four negate, four Carnage Tyrant was one of the the common ways to, to run the sideboard. I think I do like something like like a high impact card, like a Carnage Tyrant, to uh, to win the mirror match. What do you think about that? I, mean, I don't know. You're, you're likely to take I, out Fogs, right? Yeah, but I just don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know that that's really what it's about. Maybe Carnage Tyrant comes down, and that's just like enough so that you. Um, so that you're like, oh, I, uh, I, I Teferi ultimate, and I don't just automatically win. But I don't even know if that's true because, like, you're still going to take some turns, and you still have access to stuff like Nazahal Primal Tide and Cleansing Nova. So I don't know. I don't know, man. It could be okay. I don't know enough about the matchup there, but I, I would be wary of putting too many eggs into one basket. Uh, what do you think about the Oath of Teferi? That's, that was also a card that was played in some versions. It seems like, I don't know. It's fancy. Making your Planeswalkers a, a little bit more Planeswalktacular might be a way to get an advantage in the mirror. Could be. I don't love the Marari's conjecture. That's the one card that, and maybe, you know, maybe that could be something else. You know, maybe that's where you get an extra current Snipple Sundering or a Tefer- Oath of Teferi. But uh, in terms of any of the uh, the other decks, um, did anything catch your eye? Like, obviously, like, Yuzu's black-red deck was as industry as they co- industry standard as they come, Right. Um, I mean, it was kind of a hybrid of everything. It was that style that, like, uh, we played at the last one of just uh, two of this, two of this, two of this, two of this. But that's kind of the standard way to play the archetype now. And Romeo's wasn't particularly different. I think this red-black deck is just very, very solid. I I mean, I think it's worth talking about Yuzu's deck a little bit. He's playing essentially a mono-red deck, right? His black cards in the main are only unlicensed disintegration, and a single copy of Cut to Ribbons. Although he has three unlicensed disintegration, which is heavy for these days, right? And then the, just the the buyback on Scrap Heap Scrounger. Like, he doesn't have... Yeah, I mean, this is the same. We, we, we usually don't play any black in the main deck except for Scrap Heap Scrounger. This is actually a little heavier than most because of uh, the cut and three disintegrations, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, don't know, I guess there's some that, like, have way heavier black, like... We've seen decks that have, like, Arguel's Bloodfast in the main deck or, you know, even um, Nebraska's Contempt. So, I don't know. It's not anything earth-shattering, you're right. Uh, I think the craziest thing to me is that he's got two on-crop crashers. That's an unusual split. Yeah, that's definitely one that you don't always see him play two. Like, either they're playing three or more or zero. But I, I I can get behind it. You gotta you gotta you gotta make some cuts somewhere. And if you just think it's right to add one extra unlicensed disintegration, well, where are you gonna get that three from? One strategic school soul scar mage in this deck. One is the best number. They have diminishing returns. Yeah, I mean, not if you have a lot of spells. <laughs> no, they still do. They still do. The first one's definitely better than the second one. Because like the first one, you play on turn one. The second one, it's like, are you gonna play it on turn two? Oh yeah, it's it's uh it's just way worse than most of your other cards at that point. Yeah. Plus its ability of turning damage into counters, it doesn't stack. So if you have two of them in play, you're only getting the benefit of one. I agree. Um so what do you what are you most excited by from from this Pro Tour? Uh the Raptors Raptors Death Shadow deck, the Nexus of Fates deck. Yeah, I thought the Nexus. I thought the Nexus of Fates deck was like the sickest standard deck. The way that uh, that he's in the Seif, Williams, B. Rube, like the the way that they did it was like the breakout standard deck. I thought the Greg Orange's Blue Eye Control deck, which is very resilient, very straightforward, good. I think Red Black is obviously like the deck to be as a baseline. Still, but uh, I but I think that going forward, I don't know that the Nexus of Fate deck will age that well. Whereas I think that the blue, I think the blue black death shadow deck will age well. Oh, I think, I think blue, that, the blue black death shadow deck 
is going to henceforth be one of the decks to play in Legacy, right? Like, this is a new archetype, uh, and that, like, it's it's not going away, right? I agree. Yep, I agree. So to me, that's 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 what's got me excited. There is uh, that, and I I think that we're going to see a little bit of an adjustment as more people take seriously just how defining of an influence death and taxes is. Yeah, I mean, death and taxes has been a player in the format for a long time. I, I do think that that. Uh, I don't think it's gotten the respect it deserves, though. There's some people respect it, but I think it's very mixed. There's a lot of people that are like, eh, I can beat it with my standard deck. Yeah, I mean, only like maniacs who are, you know, just won an FNM with a mono red standard deck would think that, though. Like, if you would come in second in, 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 in FNM, you might not have that insane thought. <laughs> but at least they tried it, they applied science. <laughs> And science hit them in the face. <laughs> oh, my God. Swords, when you get, you're like, oh, okay, I'm playing this t- perfectly. Boom, Hazaret in for, I gain five? Wait, what just happened? Yeah. Dude, swords to Swords, swords is nice against Hazaret. No mas, no mas. <laughs> I'm just surprised they let you get up to four. Uh, well, All right. it, it didn't happen often, but it happened because I got, you know. Sorts of pressures in the face. All right. Well, lots of cool decks. I mean, that's what's going to happen when you have three constructed formats, though. Yep. All right, man. See you next week. Goodbye. Then life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge into jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis. Lost a lot of friends got left behind.